Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIE Cable Theft Chapter webinar on combating the scourge of cable theft. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen. We'd like to urge you when you do post a question tonight to please also say where you're from. We would like to know where our attendees are from. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of uh, this webinar will be made on the SIE YouTube channel, SIIEE TV, under the Cable Set Chapter playlist. The registration link is in the chat box. Please click on it and register. It is, it's free, so you can receive prompts for when we do new uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. I'd like to now introduce you to our host tonight, Mr. Ren Spindermann, who is a technical advisor for SARPA, which is the South African Revenue Protection Association and an executive member of the, of the association. He has 47 years of related experience in law enforcement and revenue protection services. He currently represents SARPA and all the relevant forums and coordinates all the operational aspects of the association. He represents SAPA on the SAPS Non-Ferrous Metal Crime Combating Committee and is also an International Liaison Officer on the Executive of the International Utility Revenue Protection Association. Previous work experience includes the South African Police Services, ESCOM, Gray Security Services and Revenue Investigations. Over the years, he has been involved in many revenue protection and metal theft combating efforts in utilities across the African continent. In the process, he has developed several courses on these subjects, which he has presented in Africa, Asia, and the Americas in tandem with papers at events across the globe. Over to you, Renz. Good day, everybody. Uh, welcome here today to this very important um, uh, webinar. We are thankful to have you here today. We've got a huge group of very important experts here today who will be talking to you on different issues regarding uh, the cable theft scourge um, that we are experiencing currently in South Africa. Um, today we have, we've got uh, four panelists here um, and these panelists, I will, I will present them to you as soon as we start with them. Um, two of the panelists will be sharing, we will be sharing um, uh, three of us in the beginning will be sharing one presentation where we will come and talk to you about it and then we will have two other presentations following after that. As all of you know in South Africa really it's a big problem now and, and when you go to the news and wherever you go you will see the, the, the talk about this problem. It really becomes so important for us to deal with this and right through the country we are looking at different ways of dealing with this. So to be able to do that, it needs teamwork. It needs teamwork from everybody involved in, in uh, all the role players in South Africa. And one of the most important ones is the police, the South African police services. So today we have here Brigadier Bert van der Walt, who is with the legal department of the SAPS. And um, so welcome Br Brigadier van der Walt. Brigadier van der Walt is a B Judas LLB LLM, worked as a public prosecutor in Johannesburg District and Regional Court. He was admitted as an attorney and practiced in such, such before joining the SA Police Services in 1994. He's currently the Section Head Operation Legal Support, policing with functions mostly related to operational and legal issues. Functions include assisting the civilian secretariat, for the police services in drafting police related operational legislation and piloting such legislation through parliament. So Brigadier van der Waal is the lead in all of these legal act, uh, acts and he's the guy who has to talk for us in parliament which is indeed not a good job to do. Uh, we applaud him for doing all those things and we welcome here, him here today. The second person that's going to be on the panel is um, uh, uh, 
Mr. Rudolf Fulyun. Oh, my apologies, Renz. Okay. The second person is Mr. Rudolf um, uh, Fulyun from Business Against Crime. And as you know, Business Against Crime has been has been leading us for some time with regard to to how to get businesses to deal with this problem. And a lot of things that's happening around this crime is relinked to businesses and therefore it's very important to have Rulof here. Thank you very much Rulof for joining us today. Um, Rulof is a national project manager at, at uh, Business Against Crime SA. Uh, Rulof is an industrial engineer by trade like most of you sitting on this forum today and focuses on automated enforcement of legal requirements in law enforcement systems specifically in developing the National Traffic Information System, the NATIS system we all know about. Some related work was done in Zimbabwe and included work in standards development at the SABS. That sounds like you, Patrick. He joined Business Against Crime South Africa BACSA as National Project Manager in April 2016. Business Against Crime was created by business as an independent, non-profitable organization in 1996 and became a division of the Business Leadership South Africa in June 2020. Business Against Crime channels business resources with the SAPS, Department of Transport, Customs, and the National Prosecuting Authority. His work in includes cross-project uh, processes and governance structures, designs, and implementation. Welcome to the, the webinar, Rudolf. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so without further ado, what I will do is I will, we will go and I will call up my presentation to you that we will doing, be doing today. And it, it, thank you very much. I just want to hear, Mix, can you see it? Perfect, thank you. Okay, right. There you can see that really this is a big problem. This whole issue of, of revenue protection of Okay, just hold on, I've got a problem with this. The whole problem of, of this cables and the loss of revenue is a huge issue. If you look at that area there, how is that policeman gonna know what to do with those cables? It's cables all over the place. How are they going to identify it? This is inside a scrapyard. Just imagine yourself being in that mess there. What are you gonna be doing about this? The good news is that really we are, we are dealing with this problem all the time especially from the electric infrastructure we've been been very busy with with regard to to all of this um issues i've got a mix i've got a problem what's wrong range it doesn't want to the, the slides are st stuck on my side just press escape mm -hmm. and try again Okay, so still stuck. Okay, there we go. The, the theft of cable from electrical infrastructure has been escalating progressively, particularly over the last three decades. The staggering losses to the electricity industry and consumers are clear, yet the consequential impact of these crimes has not been well understood. In other words, we can see the piece of cable that's stolen. We can see the piece of infrastructure that has actually been damaged. But can we see what is the consequential losses? What is the hospital and all the things down the line? What's happening to them? And that is where we are running short at this period of time because we really can't know what our losses are. In the beginning, we used to say we are losing millions. Then we changed, changed to 1 billion, 2 billion, 14 billion. At this stage, all we can say it's billions. So we actually don't know what our losses are. And that is a staggering thing. In recent years, socioeconomic drivers, potential by the global pandemic, have resulted in further compounding of theft and vandalism to essential infrastructure. This has brought about more urgent and determined global efforts from all stakeholders up to government level to arrest these devastating activities. So in this webinar, we're gonna look at how we can deal with, how can we have a multifaceted strategy to come and deal with this? This, this webinar we're having today is a mouth-watering one for what's going to happen later in the year. So I'm not going to let that cat out of the bag. But what we wanted to achieve here today is to give you the idea how deep this problem is, what we have created, and see what, what is the, the compounded problem we are sitting with at this stage. 
So why are we here today? We are here today because, like I said, this billion rand trade, it's a big black hole. All our money is going in there. And who is taking the brunt of this? This is our rail transport. When we came out of pandemic, crossed it with the, the trains back on the line and some of the lines were gone. It's a telephone wires you see hanging off all the time when you drive next to the road. It's your cell phone network that won't work after the cables have been stolen or there's, there's a blackout because the batteries have been stolen. And then, of course, the, the consequential things is about banks, hospitals and other industries that is dependent on these services that's been taken away by these vandals. In order to finish all of this and sort all of this out, it needs to be one huge team effort. The other day, I was saying on national TV, guys, stop trying to change uh, things. Just do what you need to do and just work together. In the bottom, you will see there's a picture of uh, people sitting there. That is the metal theft unit in Cape Town, a uh, city of Cape Town that used to be called the Copper Edge, which is now called the metal theft unit. There you can see a lot of individuals from different departments that have been thrown together in a utility. And their goal is to try and stop this. Now, what happened? They brought the losses of 30 million down to 300,000 um, the next year. So what we need to do is we need to get our police, our parastatals, our law enforcement entities within the utilities, the security companies, police forums, and then Business Against Crime, Rudolph and those guys. We need to get all of them to pull together to get our services back on again. How does the cycle work with regard to these non ferrous metals? Um, you can look around that, that drawing we got there. It starts over the mining where actually, this has been asked a lot from me when we talk to the judicial staff. They say, why are they stealing this cable? And there's the answer, because it starts over mining, they manufacture the things what we use, the cables and whatever, then it gets sold to the utilities or parastatals, and somebody comes around and steals it. Then we need investigators to go and try and find it. If we miss it, they resell it. We try and stop that by creating a flash unit within the police to go and do a scrap dealer investigations and inspections to try and see how we can stop this trade going on. The ones that we miss gets exported out of the country. It gets recycled. It gets reused exported and you buy it back in your tv or cars or whatever you you are buying that that specific cables are, th are there because it's been recycled into the system so that's what happens all the time and that is why this is such a lucrative market so what should we be doing we should be doing what we are doing today we should share information but the two key role players that we are very interested in sharing is the judicial part and the SAPS, which we got on, the, on board today. And the judicial side, we are, you won't believe it, we are sensitizing judges and prosecutors and all of those people. And what we are trying to, to tell them is they need to understand the impact of these crimes. The impact, you will talk, we hear us talking about the impact all the time. The impact is so important. We just spoke about that in this previous slide. Also, the options available to these prosecutors because they got different kinds of acts and laws. We have actually, uh, there's a, a very good law and a, a very um, successful law that has been, been created, and which Brigadier van der Walt will talk about just after this session by myself. And we need to tell them that that is not the only thing. They can use other laws as well. And um, we, it needs to be explained to those prosecutors. Then also what we need is dedicated prosecutors, because when the cases go to court, if there is prosecutors that has, doesn't know about this crime, they would not be able to actually know what to do. And they would, they would keep on handing the cases from one to another. So it's very important for us that we either sensitize all the prosecutors or we get dedicated ones that we can actually um, sensitize. Then on the police side, we need to explain to them the modus operandi of criminals. Myself being an ex-policeman, they don't teach us those things in a college about these type of criminals that we're encountering now. We also need to look at the crime scene analysis because that is where the evidence is brought from. We need to look at that very urgently, otherwise we can't prove anything in court. And then we need to establish multidisciplinary task teams. Now, on this side, they will explain to you what is happening in the country right now. 
And then we also, like the same with the dedicated prosecutors, we need dedicated investigators, people that knows what to do, people that are involved. And maybe, Rudolf, you can also link that to the task teams later on again. So how do we create awareness? We need to put up signs everywhere. Since 90, the early 1990s, we've been looking at these crimes. We've been running around in the bushes. We have been trying to, in a covert way, deal with this problem. We are now saying we need to come out of that. We need to get to an area where we talk about it like we're doing today. We need to even tell the criminals, like in that, that sign there, <laughs> beware. And Patrick will talk about that later. Beware, we are looking for you. Don't come on the site. So what we need to do is use the power of the me media effectively. We need to have intelligence sharing between the role players. You won't believe it that in a in a in a area there would be four or five different role players, and each will keep his intelligence close to his his heart. He won't talk about it because somebody else is going to tell him what uh, uh, let the store the cat out of the bag. So we need to share all the information between the role players so they know who is responsible for what. The parastatals need to do awareness campaigns. They need to promote uh, awareness and we need to do training and sensitizing session. Just in the last two weeks in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, we have sensitized over 250 policemen, utility members and judiciary staff. So this is what needs to be done. You need to go out there and tell everybody about what is the problem. So what is important with regard to um, the processes? And this is my last slide. You need to we need to protect the scene a lot of you sitting out there when you your technicians whoever is coming out to the scene they walk around they all what they want to do is to get the service back on again we do understand that uh, but it's important that all the the evidence that's on the scene be protected in some way and then we can go over to the next step which is forensic investigations to try and prove who uh, with dna and 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 marks and things on that we can now prove that that person or that uh, uh, syndicate was there and then we mustn't just run around the bush or lie behind the, the, whatever we need to have intelligence we need all this exercise need to do be done through intelligence we get the information then we do the investigation and then a very important one which Bert will talk about we need to oppose the bail because we lie around catching these guys night after night they go to court they get bail they're gone we never see them again. So we need to find a way of opposing both. So Bert will explain that to you. Then we also need expert witnesses. And that there again comes in the impact statement. We need impact statements from all the, 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 the people that has had the, the um, infrastructure stolen. They need to tell us about the impact, not so much for us, but more for the judges. And then we need to neutralize the syndicates. And that, that may be, Rulof can talk about the syndicates with, for us as well. So for that, there's a, there's a, that is a mouthful. So from, from different areas, we have written some guidelines. These guidelines, how to search the scrap yards, these guidelines, how to do operational exercises. And one of the biggest guidelines we've written is NRS 101 of 2011. Um, just last year, November, we finished this edition. We talked about the reduction of theft and utility service metals. Um, you can contact myself or contact any of of the SARPA members, and we can send you a copy of this document. It's very, very important. You, everything that I'm talking about now is inside that document. Really advise. It took us five years to review. Then the last of the least. Nine. This is a revision of the old act that was, that was written in 1956. And on the 1st of April 2009, this, this act came, came to work. And from there onwards, the police has put together units called flash units, which of which one person is on every police station that deals with the, the, the licensing and, uh, and control of these secondhand goods people. But that's not why we're here today. The police is looking at that side of it. So after that, we decided we needed more. So what is more? The, the Criminal Matters Amendment Act, the CMA. Now I hand over to Brigadier Bert van der Waal, and he will explain to you from here onwards. Thank you very much, Rens. Um, I'm going to talk to the Criminal Matters Amendment Act, and then here and there uh, just interject 
some of the latest developments. This Criminal Matters Amendment Act was specifically drafted to combat essential infrastructure crime. Um, and this Amendment Act actually amends to a large extent the, the common law. I don't want to get into the technicalities thereof, but it creates a new offense that um, focuses specifically on essential infrastructure related offenses. Uh, and I'll talk to the offense and the bail and the minimum sentences just now. Um, I just need to point out that when we talk, you can go to the next slide, Vince. Thanks. When we talk about essential infrastructure here, we mean any uh, energy, transport, water, communication, sanitation, etc., cetera, um, service that is basic, that is a basic public service. So we're talking about most of the utilities uh, here. Now, this offense, and I'm going to read it, any person who unlawfully and intentionally tampers with, damages, or destroys essential infrastructure, or colludes with or assists another person in the commission, performance, or carrying out of an activity referred to in paragraph A, and who knows who ought, or ought reasonably to have known or suspected that it's essential infrastructure, is guilty of an offense. Um, you can immediately see that we are talking about two types of uh, two types of crime here. The first one is the tampering. Now, tampering is defined very widely in the Act. Um, and that was done for a specific purpose to ensure that uh, we cast the net as wide as possible to uh, catch all the offenders. Tamper basically includes altering, cutting, disturbing, interfering with, interrupting, manipulating, etc., etc. So uh, any person who, who really interferes with a basic public service uh, will fall under that. Then paragraph B specifically deals with the collusion or assistance of another person. And here we talk about uh, the scrap metal dealers and the recyclers who may be involved in these criminal activities. Thanks, Rens. It, 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 it seems you can go it to the next one. Okay, no, that's it fine. It takes a bit of time. I'll, I'll just see if I can get it to the next one. You can start talking, Rens. Okay, thanks. The next slide, we just refer to the minimum sentences there. I'm not going to expand too much on that, but there are uh, minimum sentences for a, for a whole a range of offenses, which includes obviously the tampering with and the collusion, but also other offenses in terms of the criminal, uh, the, the Second Hand Goods Act, rather, uh, also theft. If I can give you an, another example, if security people or the, the police or law enforcement are involved in these crimes, there's a specific dispensation for them as well in terms of the minimum sentences. Um, but uh, I see there's reference made to Annex C. Those documents are available from uh, SARPA or from RENS uh, if anyone is specifically interested in that uh, type of, of minimum sentences. If you look at Section 3, it makes it very clear that Parliament intended to convey the seriousness of this offence to the courts. The offender may be sentenced to imprisonment for a period of 30 years, or in the case of a company, a fine not exceeding 100 million rand. Now, if you look at a life sentence, that's normally around 25 years. So um, you can imagine that any judge or magistrate will have a very clear idea that Parliament intended this uh, sentence to be, uh, or this offence rather, to be seen in this very serious light. The um, courts have, up to now, some of the cases that have served before the courts, uh, offenders have been uh, sentenced really harshly, uh, sometimes 15 years, etc. So uh, this Criminal Matters Amendment Act is really a a very good tool also in uh, combating this um, so that we might send a clear message out to potential offenders that, um, you know, if you get caught, you're going to jail for a very long time. If we go on to the next slide, we look at the, the bail conditions, and um, Rens made mention of this, uh, and he put me in a bit of a spot about that, but uh, that's no problem. 
the bail provisions are also very specific. Um, I trust that the slide will change soon, Renz. So I'll continue in the meantime, not to waste uh, time. The bail I'm conditions... Okay, I'm trying to change it. Just hold a moment. Okay. I think I should continue in the meantime. Um, okay, just the, keep on talking. Yeah, the Criminal Matters Amendment Act makes specific provision for for bail. Now, in normal circumstances, in lesser offences, the police can grant bail. Um, and then more serious offences, a prosecutor can grant bail. But in terms of the um, Criminal Matters Amendment Act, a suspect cannot get bail from either the police or a prosecutor. They have to go to court in terms of Section 60 of the Criminal Procedure Act. And then they will have to convince the court that it's in the interest of justice that they be released. Um, I think what is important here is that the initial information and evidence that is before the court will um, clearly indicate that this is a very serious offence and that it may not be in the interest of justice to, um, to grant bail to an offender. And this is where the impact statement will really provide good guidance to the court. I'm going to talk about about the impact statement a bit later on. But I think it's important that um, when we register these cases with the SAPs, that there is a person who can really um, make a statement to say, this is the seriousness of the offence. This offence is fairly pre prevalent in our municipality or with our utility and also the type of losses that have been suffered as a result of this. And that brings us to the next point, the impact of the offence. You can go back one, three, thanks. So the, the impact on, of the offence on basic public services to the public is a, an aspect that really needs to be brought before the court. And the only people who can do that is the utilities or the municipalities themselves. It often happens that um, the prosecution and charges, etc., related to cable theft is left to the security people at the utility or the, the municipality. And that only results in uh, a whole ivory tower approach where the, the engineers, for example, are not involved in the uh, charges that are laid. And it's very important that the prevalence of the offence and also the types of losses that are suffered by the municipality or the utility be brought to the attention of the court. Then finally, um, while we're on the topic of the impact of the offence, I just want to make another remark. The Criminal Matters Amendment Act was one initiative to address uh, this type of essential infrastructure crime. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition are also busy with an initiative that they are coordinating. Uh, SAPS is participating in that. They created a, a metal theft task team. And they recently published a draft policy in the Government Gazette on 5 August 2022. Uh, they published the draft uh, policy for, for comments. But what this basically boils down to is that they're going to follow a three-phase three approach to um, especially cable theft, but also it, it's also brought into other aspects of, of metal-related uh, crimes. The first phase of this is that they intend to prohibit export of copper for a period of six months to see how that affects the, the industry. because. The demand from overseas uh, is really large and um, the copper prices are therefore very high depending on that type of demand. It's interesting that whenever a country like China starts with infrastructure investment and building 
serious building and, and creating infrastructure. The copper theft, and not only in South Africa, in other jurisdictions as well, even in places like uh, the UK and the USA, the incidence of copper theft increases dramatically and the copper prices rise uh, together with that. So the six months export prohibition is intended to, to see what effect that has on the market so that people who, who recycle copper can only put it back into the system in South Africa uh, for manufacturing of cables and other uh, necessities. The second phase, and these phases are not, not uh, necessarily distinct from each other, they may overlap. The second phase includes amendment of some legislation, and one of the, the initiatives here will be to amend the Second Hand Goods Act regulations that pertain to uh, scrap metal recyclers, uh, to tighten it up a little bit and to ensure that all the information regarding sales and uh, also uh, acquisitions are properly, that these are properly documented and the particulars of the person selling to them are taken. One of the other initiatives is also to prohibit cash sales at scrap metal recyclers, um, because then you obviously create a evidentiary link between the, the EFT and the offender. And then broadly, the third phase would uh, basically consist of looking at existing legislation, Acts of Parliament, and one of the, the ideas here is to create a separate piece of legislation that specifically regulates scrap metal, so that we're not only reliant on the Second Hand Goods Act to regulate this type of offence. So these initiatives are all currently running, and hopefully that will assist um, in preventing and combating these crimes. Hopefully we will get more successful pro prosecutions under the Criminal Matters Amendment Act. And uh, I would really urge you, if you are with a municipality or utility, that um, the Criminal Matters Amendment Act be used when a charge is laid with the police, so that the police can immediately see that this is serious, firstly, Secondly, bail cannot be granted to the suspect. And thirdly, indicate to the magistrate that there's a, a minimum sentence. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I will get it, an opportunity possibly when there are any questions afterwards. Thank you, Rens. Thank you very much, um, Bert. Uh, thank you very much for that insight from your side. It's very interesting to hear and uh, we all thank you for your hard job out there i i fully we fully appreciate that and uh, we, from our side in the business uh, we can just say that we fully support your effort and and we want to thank you for everything that's been done so over from here onwards we will now go over to Rolf. Um, we've given you quite a few things to talk about um right over to you let's see what you can explain to us yeah, Rens, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, uh, the best motivation that we ever saw in terms of impact was when uh, when the um, magistrate himself's electricity was affected by the person that he had to judge. Um, so yes, the motivation for giving a proper sentence is sometimes uh, something else than the real impact statement. Yeah, I mean, what we we had a session a few months ago with uh, SABC and. Um, and the, the specifics there that was managed, it's the interesting and that some of the background that we that I want to talk about. And the first thing is that electricity is our um, is is our energy source of choice. Uh, it was promised in in 1994 as part of the elections. Um, and really, if you compare uh, the time it takes to to boil uh, one and a half liters of water in a kettle compare that against a pot on a gas stove, it's just not comparable. If you look at the, the energy flow uh, when you charge your Tesla, which is not in South Africa yet, the, the, the energy possibilities is, is just, so it, electricity is our energy of choice. And the method of transfer is through metal cables. Um, and this creates um, infrastructure that's available. 
And part of, if you look at the business uh, side of, on the criminal side, is that um, the infrastructure is available. You need simple tools uh, to extricate it. And uh, there's a legal way uh, to get, uh, there is a legal um, in, in metal recycling and, and scrap dealers, um, an easy way to get access to a network to get rid of the stuff. Because as we know, you, you cannot prosecute someone um, for essential infrastructure unless you can prove that the cable in question was actually installed or was, uh, was meant for, for uh, use in essential infrastructure. Um, the interesting part is in terms of resources in, on the crime side is that, uh, like, uh, uh, I can't recall specifically, one of the academics from U UJ a few weeks ago said, uh, a criminal is never unemployed. So, <clears throat> uh, officially, uh, the criminals can't uh, maybe included in our un unemployment figures, which is quite high. But uh, it doesn't mean <clears throat> that they don't have a source of income. I mean, a person that is reported unemployed uh, is fairly e easily gets involved in uh, in crime because that it, there's no uh, CV required or anything like that. You prove yourself as you go along. Um, and honestly, the the networks um, knows fairly well what your skills. Are. If you look at cash in transit specifically, the specialists and like. And uh, regardless of, of how simple uh, copper crime is, copper theft is, there are definitely people that is more prevalent or uh, more skilled at, at doing it efficiently and working through it. So yeah, it's uh, in that respect a business. And uh, where policing of, of, of policing of, of this theft is bound by laws, um, uh, well, very effective laws that we that we have in place um, in terms of criminal matters amendment act specifically, and the opportunities do exist for proper uh, um, law enforcement process. It comes back to everyone that has to understand what the role is. Now, um, we not, we're working with the NPA on, on a few other projects, but uh, the specifics that we we, we spoke about these. Um, from the incident up to a, a person actually being um, go to jail or, or pay a fine for, for transgression, there's a lot of things that go wrong. Um, and that's where we try to sensitize from our side uh, business to make sure that uh, the crime scene is properly uh, protected, uh, that the evidence are properly handled. Because uh, the moment one thing goes wrong, then that case is gone. Um, and what we've uh, done in the in the near past on, on, on other related projects as well is that we really make a decision whether it is uh, makes sense to prosecute a case further. Um, there's several challenges in in this whole business process of prosecuting cable theft, and uh, that's why the NFN Triple C that uh, that is referred to in Rens's um, uh, CV, if you could call it that. Um, it does exist, and it's a cross-cutting um, committee that looks at, at, at uh, non-ferrous metal crime. But it's expanded to, to include essential infrastructure crime in general. So in terms of, of having um, cross-functional uh, committees together and teams like the, the previous copy aids that's changed, and you will see um, in terms of Twanies, one uh, it was established in 2017 and then established again in 2020. Um, the teams do exist and there are successes, but uh, we'd like to have uh, better successes because we do it right every time. So a lot of it has to deal with uh, with our teams in terms of when the incident has happened um, to do everything according to the book because we want to be successful in the prosecution. And the opportunity exists for, for the cross-pollination to, to really teach one another from, from the investigating officer through to the security officer, through to the, the prosecutor, to have a proper knowledge of, of how we handle this kind of crime. Um, and as Ren said, uh, either you have to make everyone aware of it or you have to have specialists. Um, we, we had uh, very good success in the past with, uh, with um, the Scorpions because 
they, the investigating officer and the prosecutor sat in the same room all the time. Um, we are having similar successes with DPCI together with the NPA and with the NPA's own investigation section as well. So in terms of, of legal law enforcement, the structures and the laws exist. And we, what we have to do is make sure that we do the right thing every time and obviously get corruption out of it. So uh, interesting developments, um, uh, Bert referred to the suggestion of, uh, of the Department of, uh, uh, of uh, blocking export of, it's actually broader as far as I understand it, that it will be all scrap metals. Um, but the, what's interesting in that respect, and, and that's basically what, what we saw is in the past eight to 10 years, ITAC hasn't issued any permit for, for uh, copy export. So um, it all came down and still comes down to enforcement at the border. So one of the problems that we have in the uh, identified in the NFN C as well is that um, our customs officials at border is, is concentrating on uh, goods that goes into the country because on that is tax payable. Um, and really, we don't have, appear to not have the resources to inspect every container that goes out or to scan every container that's out. So in terms of resources of border policing, regardless of, of, the, of the rules in place, uh, we have to make sure that we are able to, to do in law, law enforcement at the border on the way to Arbor and make sure that the that these doesn't go out. Um, the successes that we had on blocking export was because of tip-offs. Uh, it was never just routine inspections of um, of goods that leave harbors or leave our borders. It was on tip-offs. So we're very dependent on people knowing something and talking to something about it. And that's basically the same we said uh, in, in the SABC interview a few weeks ago, is communities know who the people are that's part partaking in copper theft. And yes, it is a risk. I mean, the, these uh, these guys are not hesitant to kill someone. As we've seen, the murder rates, uh, 57 people uh, per day in the first six, first three months of this year. Or, and that's it's, it's devastating. It means that me personally have a chance in one in, of one in a million to be killed, murdered today, not in a traffic, or traffic accident or anything like it, murdered. So it's a it's a very risky kind of environment we live in. Um, other thing that that uh, well, that's part of the initiative there is to make it uh, make to block cash handling. And what we've seen in cybercrime is that the syndicates will use a an account new. So a person will be paid one percent of what go, what's going through the account just to abuse his uh, identity. To create, to create an account, so that will be a challenge, and we'll have to look at that. Um, and then, uh, well, the other good news is that, and in the State of the Nation address in February, um, the State President President has uh, announced the creation of essential infrastructure task teams. And what that basically means is, or is, is 18 um, hotspots throughout the country, 18. Um, you call what we call it from this <laughs> on the police side. I'm just thinking of name. Um, uh, it will, yeah. Let's let's leave it at that. But there will be 18 essential infrastructure task teams created, um, and we saw definite progress again. Um, Western Cape always first in complying with with that kind of initiative, because Natal had an official launch as well. So the other provinces teams will uh, be up and online, and that basically. Uh, the is creation of, of uh, cross-functional uh, teams within the district, that's the one I was looking for, within a police district um, to attend to, on the one hand, essential infrastructure crime, but the, on the other hand, uh, also something that we picked up in the past and that is affecting the uh, electricity supply industry and communications as well is uh, extortion. Where, where people uh, will hijack a site um, and they insist on being part of the project. So uh, we're looking forward to the official launch. Um, it uh, has been postponed. It would have been this Monday past on the 5th of September of these EITTs. 
and we're looking forward to the official launch. But uh, it doesn't matter. The, initial, the national launch um, is uh, will be with pomp and ceremony, but it actually comes back to these teams are there and they are being created. So the, yeah, the, the latest development in that is that, that there is a, a change in attack. Um, but our final point, uh, my final point is that uh, the only way we're going to address this is with our communities uh, identifying the criminals. But for to be able to do that, we need a trust um, relationship between communities and the police in the area. And we also, we definitely need to protect the people that come out as witnesses and point out the, the, the criminals in the area. Uh, well, that's uh, that's my part of the story, Rens, um, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it is a very important part. Um, load shedding has created a lot of opportunities for for uh, crimes in this area. Um, the moment something is not used, uh, it's, it's really easy to to break it down and uh, and uh, put it somewhere else, sell it for a few bucks, and uh, so the yeah. But crime criminals are opportunists and we have to try and block that opportunity and once it gets into uh, the law enforcement process we must make sure that every step is according to the book thank you Rens. back to you thank thank you very much rulo uh, thank you very much for that well, well said um from here onwards i know all of you have been listening to all this um uh, criminal things and combating on all of those things. Now we're going to go over to the technical part of this. And uh, the next speaker we've got here is Gavin Strelik, a technical specialist at ESKIM SAIEE. Uh, Gavin Strelik received his BSc in Electrical Engineering at the University of Witwatersrand in 1997. He obtained his MSc with distinction in 2016 and is pursuing a PhD in lighting protection. Has been a registered professional engineer since 2003 and has more than 20 years of related experience in electricity utility industry with ESKIM. He has been involved in several issue areas, including design, technology management, and standardization. He's present in ESKIM's research department focusing on insulation coordination. He's also involved in several industry working groups to my mitigate cable theft yes um, and gavin is with me on the nrs 059 uh, working group where we are looking at this so gavin over to you thanks very much Renz, for the introduction and i can't believe i said those things about myself but um i would like to present a, a user perspective on cable theft let me just switch on my camera Okay, we can see your, your slide, you can go. Okay, so <clears throat> from my perspective, I would like to focus on the theft of material which constitutes the earthing or earthing systems that we have in our infrastructure. So this is mainly our electricity supply infrastructure, but it also affects all other areas. And the question is, is there a technical way out? Is there a solution? Is there something robust and foolproof that we can pursue? that will greatly reduce this problem. So I've said that I'm here presenting this information for your consideration, but I am a simple engineer that just wants to look for a, a technical solution and I want to solve this problem. So when we look at the problem of cable theft and in particular earthing as well, um, the, there's a hierarchy of risk that we experience. The top tier risk is actually cable theft or the theft of earthing materials, because this renders the electrical system non-functional. In other words, protection systems may not operate, and it means that our infrastructure can literally burn. We can lose transformers. So we spend a lot of time on coming up with maintenance plans, how to make sure that the system is in good order. And we also spend a lot of time on looking at the design. And we are calculating whether we should be using 70 millimeter square or 150 millimeter square. But at the end of the day, if there's no cable in place, the whole system falls apart. So that is the highest, highest risk that we face as engineers. So uh, it, this problem of cable theft, it leaves us in a situation where 
or where we are perpetually making a plan. So there are numerous hit and miss solutions that we have attempted. And most of the techniques that we've implemented in the past are only partially effective. So whilst they do bring about a statistical improvement in the situation, reducing um, the problem, the success rate is really inadequate. So the, the results are not what we need. So it's a little bit about um, the conservation of misery. Whatever we try to do improves the situation, but it has serious disadvantages and drawbacks. So we are searching for some solution which would present a more favorable balance between pros and cons. So we see in these pictures, we are putting out fires. We're trying to make connections using all sorts of different materials out of desperation to keep the system operational. And we're saying that at least some sort of connection is better than nothing. At least the system is functioning. But at the end of the day, we're really running systems which are very much compromised. So every warrior knows that you cannot trust man, nor woman, nor beast. The only thing you can trust is steel, your sword. So when it comes to combating this problem, some people have uh, taken the approach to use steel as an alternative to the more precious metals like copper. So this is something that really leads to a situation which has serious disadvantages. In order for us to come up with a technical solution using steel, we have to go for very heavy conductor cross sections, uh, leading to expensive installation. Uh, we also need skilled welders. This is only really effective if we're going to employ cathodic protection. It has in fact been used for several decades in the former Soviet Union uh, quite effectively. And steel is used in all the BRICS countries except South Africa, interestingly. We can say that steel has even been used in Germany, except in those applications where the current is so high that steel will not suffice, at least practical cross sections. So these pictures also come from applications of galvanized steel for earthing in India at 765 kV level substations. And we asked the question, this conductor that runs down a galvanized steel structure, is that really necessary? So Galvanized steel can be used, but it has serious drawbacks, one of them being corrosion. So on the left-hand side, we see how these conductors can just disappear into thin air if we do not take care of the corrosion protection. Another very successful approach has been to encase the earthing system in concrete. And we've even tried to bury other cables in concrete. Determined criminals can still access the cables but generally this has proven to be very successful. Uh, so it's a question of th this material is just not accessible. It's out of sight. It's something that is largely left alone. The question is, this is really now a very suboptimal solution because the temperature rise is severely limited. We know that if we want to avoid having an explosion in concrete literally by forming steam, uh, we need to design very conservatively so that the temperature rise that's allowable is maybe only 50 degrees. So we are putting in massive conductors in order to limit temperature rises and to avoid damage to the concrete. Another su successful approach that has been used for several decades now is to use copper plated earth rods. So we see that copper is relatively soft and it's very easy to cut. Any accessible copper is easily removed within a very short period of time. Criminals usually don't bother to remove it um, completely. They will just cut off the parts that are easily obtainable. And you can see evidence there of the copper um, flat bar that has been removed. Subsequently replaced with the earth rods, and those have been in place for many years, completely untouched. So copper, earth rod, uh, copper plated earth rods have been used successfully in several utilities. And we see that because this is so difficult to cut, it really um, is largely left alone. There is some occasional signs of tampering where attempts are made at cutting the conductor, but because it's so hard, it's largely left alone. So criminals are not um, as foolish as one would expect. They know what is copper and what is valuable, and they can easily sniff out valuable materials.
So what we see here is that simple disguising of conductors has really very little impact on reducing theft. <clears throat> so one would say that you would never leave your wallet out in the open, especially if it was full of cash, you wouldn't leave it on your desk. So why are we leaving such valuable cables and copper out in the open, so easily accessible? We see in these buildings extensive use of heavy sections of copper, and um, it is just so easy, easily um, harvested by criminals. It's extremely vulnerable. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, another comment is we see that in many of these pictures, it seems as if um, the installers have deliberately avoided connecting metallic infrastructure together by leaving these gaps. And we know that this is bad practice. So that's just a comment, but this is, this is not a good situation. So we see that these conductors just disappear overnight. It's literally, um, you talk to your colleagues and say, that is going to disappear and within days it's gone. So the question is, why are we not recovering the copper and replacing it and doing something in the meantime? Why are we waiting to reactively replace this copper with some alternative? So that is money that is just lying out in the open and is accessible to criminals. <clears throat> One of the approaches that we can certainly follow is to reduce the profitability of theft. So. When it comes to um, cable theft, a big factor to consider is that a lot of this, these materials, um, um, a lot of theft occurs during the construction phase of projects and even disappears from storage facilities. So in this case, despite having security and various other systems in place, nobody knows anything about it. And so this is a big factor that we would like to have something which has much less value and it reduces the profitability of theft. So it was mentioned earlier, cash in transit. We are also facing possibilities where expensive conductors will be stolen in a similar way. And what we really want to do is we want to make thieves really sweat for their profits. And so we want to introduce some alternatives which are much less lucrative to the criminal. So a closing note is a look towards the future. Conductors like copper clad steel, which have very limited recovery value. This is the advice that we can put at our sites to criminals would be thieves, that it's, it's, it's of no value to you. Just leave it alone. And it really is a no-brainer when you see the conductor and then you see a sign which explains what it is, um, anybody will know that um, it is not worthwhile to take. So that is the closing note and a look to the future and some of the approaches that we can um, implement in trying to reduce this problem. Thank you, Rens. Thank you Thank very you. much. Th Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much for that. Um, like I said, on the technical side, there's quite a lot of things that we can do. And it's important that we do look at this. So the next expert we're having here is the guy that um, Patrick O'Halloran, uh, he's, a, he's a technical specialist with ARB and also with the SAIE. Patrick is an experienced electrical engineer with 29 years of experience in the local and international electrical utility and manufacturing industries in technical, commercial and management sectors. He has extensive experience with electrical networks, associated equipment and standards committees with a passion for cable networks up to 275 kilovolts. We, he works closely with local and international suppliers to review current and new equipment technologies and presented technical papers at many South African and international conferences. He has a bachelor's degree in heavy current electrical engineering from the Witwatersrand Technicon in 1996. ARB Global presents, presently employs him as the technical product specialist, where he is responsible for introducing a new product for the ARB holding group of companies. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time with, with Patrick on a lot of these um, uh, standard committees and things like that and uh, we are very privileged to have you here Patrick uh, over to you
Great, thank you very much, Rens. Let me just share my screen quickly. Um, I will tell and, you when uh, I see it. All right, there you should be able to see it now. I can see it. You can go. I can see myself. We can see your Rens, screen. Can we see okay. my screen? Okay. Yes, we can see the screen. All right. Okay. So, yeah, this, thank you very much. And um, yep, the no problem, six o'clock. So, this is definitely one of the latest presentations I'm doing. But um, yeah, I think, you know, we've spent a lot. But what we want to do is how do we enable this technology and these changes that Gavin was speaking about? And as we can see, uh, you know, we can declare this a war in South Africa. So just looking at it, we need to make make our network safe again. So what we're looking at here is you can see, you know, networks that have been vandalized, uh, illegal connections, and you know, just totally unsafe conditions. And a lot of these times when people cut certain conductors, actually cause outages. And these outages can be up to a week sometimes based on the damage it causes. So yeah, that's the reality. We all understand the cost of copper is increasing. And I, as an engineer personally, and Gavin would tell you, we would want to use copper everywhere. But unfortunately, you know, we just can't based on the situation we find ourselves in with copper theft. So just uh, what can we do as an industry? And I really, I really like the photo on the right. You can see something different. And these are exciting things. So looking very quickly, you know, we can physically restrain cables and conductors, put them in concrete. Gavin showed us a lot of that um, at City Power when I was there. We, we try to put concrete over a lot of the cables and it works for a while. Uh, we can look at putting alarm systems in, vibration sensors, you know, like fiber optic cables. But obviously we need to then respond to those. And that's also one of the challenges is the response times because the network is so, so vast, you know. Unique identification, and this is where Rents and I actually do a lot of work together, you know, looking at ownership of conductors and the cables, you know, how do we prove ownership? And I think this is where we're going to with these standards in the future. Uh, the visual means is what I was talking about on the right-hand side here in the photo. You can see the yellow conductor on the outside, yellow sheaths, and you can see that, hey, hang on, something is different here. It's not the conventional colors. So this is uh, the, the visual side of it. And once one case that I was involved with when I was at City Power was uh, we had an orange sheath cable and we were able to prove ownership in a in a court case because of the orange sheath cables we had just because it was only made for City Power at the time. Anyway, and the last thing is design alternative cable, you know, conductors, alternative conductor using alternative conductor materials, I should say. So looking at for earthing and for um, and for cables, but. If you know you're in a high vandalism area or high risk area, why why install copper? Why install the aluminium? Is it because there's no alternatives? Okay, so that's what we need to consider going forward. In America, just looking very quickly at America, the ASTM standards, American standards, this is specific to cable committees. You can see the different categories that they have. So um, four different types, conductors, you know, the copper ones, copper, copper and copper alloys, your, your conductors for ferrous metals, uh, bimetallic conductors and then lastly conductors with light light metals now each one of those categories is something unique and something something that we can actually learn from you know america so that's what i'm going to cover there in south africa if people don't understand the standards the t sabs sabs tc66 the technical committee um, looks at electrical cables and conductors and this is where the standards are published nationally and it's an aligned uh, very much aligned to uh, IEC, which is the European standards. And the mandate here is to keep our standards relevant. We need to look at improving safety and also user requirements have to be have to be taken uh, considered. You know, changes in technology and all that. So these links will be uh, you know ob obviously you can log on to SABS, SABS, and have a look at it. Some of the standards that have been published, and obviously sorry, I'm a member. I represent the SARWE on that committee. Um, the one one unique standard is this unique conductor marking uh, for cables, and this is looking at all different techniques, putting in a barcode, looking at serial numbers, just looking at trying to exactly give the evidence, the proof that we need, to, you know, to the police to actually prove ownership. So this standard has gone a long way in uh, putting serial numbers into cables and where possible, and um, understanding the SABs or understanding the requirements or, or safety requirements in the country of there's also compulsory standards. We had to look at how do we alternate, uh, how do we use alternative materials? So quite a while back, we started the initiative to look at the SABS, uh, the standard 1411.1, and it was agreed to it uh, at the TC66 committee to revise the standard to include these alternative materials to allow us to develop 
unique conductor, unique cables, unique and different products that where we can actually move away from the conventional copper and aluminium, which is currently the only ones that you could actually uh, get via SAB's standards. Okay, however, this standard wasn't published right near the end. It was decided that because we have a national standard and we needed to look at developing, it wasn't very clever to actually develop in a national standard. So because one is compulsory and there's a national standard, we needed to actually actually come up with a different industry standard so we were given the, the recommendation to actually look at developing what we call you know the nrs standards and just very quickly nrs is a you know rational uh, so the nrs spe the specification has been around for quite a while uh it's developed by utilities and this is obviously where we've we experienced a lot of the theft and vandalism and numerous standards have been published and Renzi spoke about 101 but we can go on talking lots about the standards. One, the most common one is load shedding. So NRS 048 part nine. So that's one that we don't like, but we had to develop it. But looking at cable or earthing systems, the NRS 102, and Gavin, obviously you were, you were the chairman of that. You, you know, we looked at all the different options and copper clad steel was obviously considered. There's quality standards mentioned and you can see the ASTM standards that ensures quality you know, of the material. And you know that's you know this is where this whole um, uh, the whole uh, industry has changed. You know, city power. And I speak a lot about city power, but effectively substations, new substations, installing earth mats with copper clad steel, not copper, and moving away from that. And obviously, this is not really we're not getting into the technical side in this thing because obviously in the next sessions that we're going to have the next webinars, we'll go into the details and talk about these technologies. But when we get to cables because we needed a, a standard to develop, an industry standard, um, and Eskim were looking at it as well with different types of technologies, but the NRS 110 was then developed, and this is specifically looking at low voltage cables with copper clad aluminium alloy conductors. Now that's a secret, that material, the aluminium alloy is very secret, uh, very uh, key to the success of this technology, and obviously has been used extensively you know, in the world, uh, worldwide. Um, and we'll get that, we'll look at those things, but it's effectively copper clad aluminium alloys. We have the same ASTM standards for quality. And, you know, this is the background. So specifically developed for, in, you know, for utilities. Okay. And um, that's, uh, well, the standards are not looking at the, it's obviously from the, it's not from the point of supply. So it does not look into the wiring code, the 10142. It's from effectively up to the meter, not beyond the meter. So that's important because a lot of the theft is happening more on the utility side. You know, so and effectively it covers all the cons, um, all the um, say cable configurations that that we would require, um, including you know service cables and you know, protection cables. So you know the standard was allowing us now to develop in the industry. So it's very exciting. It's a proven technology. These are this is a copy of an extract of a paper presented at the, um, internationally, and you can see the conclusion. You know, it's an attractive alternative to copper. And that. Um, and it's been very successful in lots of countries like Italy, wherever where they've actually had this theft and that, to, to use it into, in cables. But obviously this is a journey and we need to work closely with the manufacturers and looking at these technologies. But the exciting part is it really does stop this, the value that there is in, in, in copper trade. You know, So if you take this material, like, uh, well, actually I suppose copper clay steel would be the same, yeah? and copper clad aluminium alloy, once they try and melt it down in it, it will definitely contaminate, you know, the, the batches on it and produce a lower value. So that's quite exciting. And this is a, this is coming from the International Copper Association of Asia. And you'll, you know, as the journey goes, we'll, we'll take engineers through all these associations that have been formed looking at it. And these are just some photos, just to summarize of the alternative conductors, just looking at, you know, marking of conductors, um, coming up with unique conductor identification patterns, you could call it, a, or core identifications that say, this is specifically made for Eskimo, this is made for City Power or whoever. So it's quite exciting that we have a material that we can use in conjunction with copper in, in a way as well. No corrosion issues and, you know, it's given us that alternative to move. And um, yeah, I think this last slide rents, you know, just everything looks impossible until you until it's done. So I think we're in this exciting phase now where we can take it from this is impossible, but hey, there is there is solutions and we can look we can look north to you know other countries to actually give us this technology that we're looking for. All right. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Patrick. Uh, well said there, and thank you very much for your always um, valuable knowledge and information you give us. We've got two questions already here. Uh, thank you very much for all the panelists for the presentation. So we're going to go over now to the questions part. Uh, Niranjan has come with two questions. One about why don't we use um, oversized steel instead of copper, and also why don't we use aluminium? Uh, Kevin, you want to go on that one, or shall we go, Patrick? I can take that one. Okay, uh, aluminium is a relatively good conductor. The conductivity of aluminium is 60% that of copper. So it's an ideal choice for electrical infrastructure in place of copper. However, the corrosion potential of aluminium is really severe. So it is completely unacceptable in buried applications. So wherever you're going to do <clears throat> systems, lightning protection, earthing, you can't use aluminium below ground or in contact with concrete um, because of the corrosion problem. So we are left with steel as a potential option, but if you need to use steel as an alternative to copper, the conductivity of steel is around 12 to 15% that of copper. So for equivalent current carrying capacity, you need to upsize several times. So you might be looking at conductor cross sections that are five or so times larger than copper and it makes it very difficult to work with so in india it has been used in the past and it's also used in china but it means that the labor to install that conductor is very expensive you also need to connect the steel uh, conductors individually with <clears throat> um, with welding processes so that also requires uh, um, skilled welders which could also be a challenge for us but really, the biggest challenge with steel is corrosion. If you have steel conductors, whether they're galvanized or not, buried in relatively conductive soils, that steel is just not going to last. So um, it leaves us with steel probably being the next, next best conventional alternative to copper, but aluminium is not possible. Right, thank you very much for that, Kevin. Uh, Niridjan is going with another one. You see, what about copper silver alloy conductors? They also used and they are low value or little value of scrap. Okay, uh, Patrick, uh, go ahead. Uh, Gab, I think it just depends on the application. So I think it's very, very important to consider what application we're looking at. Um, I know silver is used on buzz bars for, you know, that's obviously to give you that electrical resistance connection. So I think as long as we're looking at moving away from conventional conductors and looking at things that are not going to be, um, you know, uh, they don't have that value that the, the, the typical um, conductors actually have, you know, that would be the secret. So, yeah, so first of all, that, that question, where is it, what, what's the focus, where do they want to use it? Um, we need to remember cables have got temperature limitations because of the insulation. Earthing have got other issues and, and you've covered a lot of them and we'll talk about it lots in the next webinar. Uh, corrosion, you know, environmental aspects that they've got to consider without insulation. So where was that? I think the answer, the question is, what was the application of that conductor? If I can just come in to add to what you said. Um, if I heard correctly, it's copper silver alloy. And if you're talking about silver as in AG on the periodic table, of course, that's the ultimate conductor. It's, a, some, it's about 5% um, superior to copper in conductivity. So um, silver is used in some electrical applications where you need the lowest possible contact resistance. So that's circuit breakers and switch gear, but it's not something that would help with earthing. A small amount of silver contaminating the copper is not really going to have a significant reduction in theft value. And I've, I've, I've never heard of that, uh, to be honest. So it's, um, it's not something that I see as feasible at all for earthing or for cables. And of course, the, any silver that one would incorporate has tremendously high value, much higher than copper. So um, the only... Yeah. Other application of silver would be if you require um, um, conductors um, for radio frequency applications where you are concerned about the skin effect and you want to rather plate a thin layer of silver on top of a copper tube. But otherwise, yeah. silver is not something we can even entertain, I would say. Yeah, if I could, yeah, if we could comment further, you know, if this, if this is a technology that is proven and, and can work, you know, that's what we should be considering as an industry. 
And I think that's the the way forward that we're going to talk about, you know, when it comes to the um, this uh, chapter that we want to establish, you know, that we're establishing, I should say. Okay, thank you very when much, you gentlemen. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I just want, I think you wanted to say that, Patrick, is that we can consider all kinds of different cables, alloys, whatever. So it doesn't say that we have to use only one specific way. It's anything that you can do to prevent them from actually stealing the cables. Um, also, Patrick, that part about contaminating the cables, we thought, uh, Transit thought about that a few years ago, and they were legally um, told not to do that because there could be claims against them uh, for damaging equipment and all kinds of things in the future. Uh, so that thing was actually laid off in South Africa. But if the rest of the world is going to go that way, then maybe we can go that way as well. The next question is, the, is, is a question towards uh, Bert. Um, is the licensing of scrap metal collectors feasible? What would be the the benefit of that? Can the registration process for SHG dealers be digitalized to allow for mapping of dealer locations against theft, hotspots, or targeting policy? Uh, Bert, I'm going to deliver the, their first view that you can answer that before we go on. Okay, thanks. Yes, the um, Licensing of of second hand dealers or recyclers uh, is not specifically within the, the functions of the South African Police Service. What we have done with the Second Hand Goods Act is to register these dealers with us so that we have all the particulars. They have to keep certain records. And uh, in terms of that, we do inspections and see whether the stock on the floor, if the copper cables there, have been taken up into the registers. There are specific requirements of, uh, you know, pertaining to the identification of the person who sells it, but also the person who buys it from the scrap metal dealer. So, in in terms of that, I think the the system currently works well in the sense that we um, have registered. I think in the in the region of three thousand dealers. I'm talking under collection now. So the, the idea is to um, have an incentive for legitimate dealers, because believe it or not, there are some scrap metal dealers who, who just want to do legitimate business. Um, so the incentive is for them to register. And the incentive for the subs to have them registered is, of course, that those legitimate dealers who have to comply with all, all the legislation applicable to them in terms of, for instance, the Waste Management Act, uh, as just one example, will inform on those illicit dealers. And, and so the, the idea was basically to get sufficient information of what's going on in the market, but also to have the registered dealers as uh, inform us on those who are not registered and not conducting their business in, in a legitimate manner. We are looking at a system to uh, to digitize the the whole second hand goods environment. And I know that one of the DTIC initiatives is also to have that done and to have these systems uh, in the SAPs and with themselves to talk to that. The idea with this uh, metal theft legislation that they are proposing is that it will be encompassing um, also the licensing of dealers, so that a de dealer will not only be registered with, with SAPs, but also be licensed by DTIC. And if they are not licensed, they, um, they cannot uh, conduct business. On the Second Hand Goods Act, I must just mention also that there is a synergy between us and, for instance, ITAC. They will not issue an export certificate to a person who's not registered as a recycler or a second hand goods dealer. So we try to, uh, especially in the NFM Triple C, as uh, Rulof uh, said, that um, you know we try to have this cross cutting discussions there to establish. Uh, working relationships between the different government departments and also the state-owned entities so that we can uh, curb this scourge. Uh, I hope that answers the question, Rens. 
Right. Thank you very much. I'm maybe going to throw the second part to to Rulof. Um, that talks about um, you know how can we monitor where the scrap dealers are. We know that the script dealers um, in different areas are locked by every police station. They have got these flash members that actually has to manage them, meet with them, uh, do um, compliance inspections with them, and all of those things is actually happening. So we actually know where they are, but we don't know where all of them are. It's the illegal ones that we don't know. And even if we know where they are, they actually have now expanded these scrap dealers to, to different farms and all kinds of things. So, um, Rudolf, maybe you can say something about that, um, how difficult it is to track these guys. Yeah, the, um, uh, as uh, the Brigadier referred to, uh, I've spoken to Flash Head Office uh, quite a while ago about the electronic register, um, and there was still some effort of some, some things out of outstanding in terms of implementing it. <clears throat> of course, uh, as you know, just mapping is, uh, is an interesting area of work, uh, but it's totally possible to, uh, I mean, even with Google Maps, at this stage you can set up your own map, your own overlays and the like. Um, the, yeah, in, in principle it is expected that uh, that a station will, will have a full awareness of, of every business that's going in, on in the area and at least know where they're not allowed and which areas are blank so that it can be filled in. Um, these, there is work ongoing in terms of, uh, of making sure that at least someone have an aerial overview of the area that it's recent. Um, the, there are some training going. Um, obviously, it's more focused on the use of uh, of drones for for operational stuff, but is a definite drive uh, to have um, have overviews of areas, uh, uh, recent uh, overviews so that you, you can detect changes, um, and that is ongoing. I know that uh, or we are aware of, um, of uh, SCB, uh, the police TMS um, that's looking at the IT systems, that they are in implementing a new GIS uh, functionality all over that will be an underlying uh, effect of, of everything they're doing. Uh, in terms of, of overlaying uh, crime information with that, it comes back to that you have to make sure, and um, in part of our legacy is that the um, case administration system, or CAS as we refer to it, is, is pretty old. Um, and in principle, uh, to, 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 to keep up with uh, the latest technology, there's a total rewrite required, which is not an easy one. I mean, uh, being involved in, in how we transferred uh, natives to e natives and then had a massive downfall for for three weeks where we couldn't function. Um, we cannot afford that. So in terms of of, uh, of technology systems in the, the police side, um, what is happening is uh, from business we we building quite a lot of architecture around the police um, and making it available. Of course, it, it has to be very um sensitively managed uh, to to not so that we don't try and do or that some people in private sector don't do the police's work but enable the police to do a proper job so coming back to it um if uh, something like that is not uh, some technology development is not happening within the government itself uh, we've seen a, a good willingness from business uh, to protect itself in that respect, uh, to gather the information and then share with police whenever that is necessary, um, and it and it works. It it all just it comes back to proper management and having the agreement from the national commissioner through these generals that so that everyone is aware of that interrelationship. Um, there's a definite um, uh, attitude or a, an agreement on that that. Without the National Commissioner's um, signature, uh, a memorandum of understanding means uh, next to nothing, because that is legally the only framework it can go through. But to answer the question, if if that architecture for, for technology does not exist within the police itself, there's a definite willingness from private sector to put the information together and then share as appropriate with the police. Thank you, Rich. Right, uh, okay, that brings us to a point um, where we, uh, I think we're running fast out of time. 
and um, we've we've heard quite a lot of things uh, about this and some of the the issues that's also i don't see any more questions here um one of the questions that's always been asked is the fact what the, why don't we call these things um sabotage now a lot of people have actually come up with that and say why, why do we have don't call this thing sabotage and and for us it's very important that we must understand that sabotage is not um, easy because sabotage you have to prove that you're trying to bring down the government or economical downfall or things like that so at this stage where we are now sabotage is not a good word to be using out there although i can see that some of these bigger forums are now being called economic sabotage um, groups and and they come forward and they say okay we we are going to do uh, economic sabotage um i don't agree with that also the part where they are saying we must make this precious metals we must co make copper and non-ferrous metals precious metals that is also an issue that that is quite um, staggering for us because at the end of the day it's very important that we must realize that if you have precious metals there's certain ways of how precious metals must be purchased and so as well as storing it, uh, all those things. I can just imagine a, a electrician driving, driving down the street with a, with a safe in the back of his van. So there's a lot of, of new ideas coming up now where people are coming and say, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? From our point of view, we feel that it's really important that we must understand that um, they, we've got good acts out there, we're doing a lot of things to deal with all these problems. But, but that brings us to the last point, which is consequential management. The question we want to ask from our side, who is going to be responsible if these acts just carry on and on? Are we keeping people responsible to put uh, um, good systems in place? It, when the consequences, who's going to carry the consequences if the whole system implodes or, or people get killed and all those kind of things? And that is the type of questions that we need to ask out there. We, we can't just say um, it's nobody's problem. So we are very, very glad at this stage that there are a lot of people are um, actually involved in this. Um, we can see we've got people here today who's listening to us and trying to understand what we're doing. And that is why we want to build up with this um, program of ours to see how we can go forward. Uh, Minx, uh, are we we getting to the end? Yes, we are. We're going over now to thank you. And uh, that will be, um, I can introduce our CEO, Mr. Leonetsi Matutwani. Over to you. Uh, a good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lianes Matutwani, SIE CEO. Uh, the fact that you've been actively listening to the presentations from the beginning of today's webinar is testament to the interest holds for you. The importance and repercussions have been discussed, and I would like to offer that the conversation should not stop here. As I to earlier, there are developments expected in future on this topic. I would like to invite you to join us in November on the 9th, 16th, and the 23rd as we unpack the topic to a greater extent, covering the technology standards and charting a way forward. Until then, you are invited to indicate your interest in establishing a chapter dedicated to the technical aspects of today's topic, cable theft, by sending an email to cabletheft at saie.org.za. You are also invited to join the SAE by going to the SAE website, sae.org.za, and clicking on the Join Now hyperlink on the top of the page. Click the Liberty Magazine and the SAE section in the Winner Platform Control Panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank uh, the panel leader. And as I'm saying, the light and the light on. I'll a lot from it and look forward to host you in November. Thank you very much and good night.
Thank you very much, everybody. Keep safe out there, and uh, we talk to you again.